Coming up in this video, I'll discuss my must-have wildlife photography equipment in 2024 and why you should leave this one piece of equipment at home. I'll compare gear specs, let you know what I have on my wish list, and explain my decision making when deciding what to pack in my camera bag. Welcome back everyone, my name is Liam and I'm a wildlife photographer in the mid coast of Maine. And today I wanted to talk about the essential equipment that I'll be using in the new year because last year I got some epic captures, I got some bucket list species, but there was one complaint that I had and we're gonna go over that today and I'll tell you why I'm gonna be leaving this one piece of equipment out of my camera bag in 2024. If this is your first time visiting my channel, thank you so much for stopping by. Do consider subscribing, I post videos every week. This video is gonna be broken down into three sections. The must-haves, the wish list, and then the keep it at homes. It's important to note here that there are no sponsorships associated with this video and I've spent all of my money, and I mean all of my money, on this equipment. Please don't tell my girlfriend that because she doesn't want that title anymore. If you know what I mean. Anyway, let's jump right into it with the must-haves. You can't shoot photography without a camera body. And I'm using the Sony a7 IV mirrorless camera. Now what's great about this camera is that it's a hybrid camera. I can shoot video and I can shoot photo. I very much jump between the two when I'm out taking photos or doing video on this channel. I'm constantly trying to vlog as much as I can, but also capture those really cool moments with some wildlife. And I found that the Sony a7 IV is gonna give me the best bang for my buck. Let me explain that. This camera has 33 megapixels and it comes in kind of a two option format. One, you can get six frames per second in an uncompressed RAW file, or you can get 10 frames per second in a compressed RAW file format. On the other hand, for video, it, this camera can shoot in 4K 60, which when I'm shooting wildlife, I'm shooting pretty much primarily in 60 frames per second because I like to slow down that footage to uh, a 24 frame timeline. If you're not a video person, essentially what that means is I can create slow-mo video that's nice and smooth, it's buttery, it's not gonna look jumpy. The last thing that's really important with it is that I can shoot in the S-Log3 picture profile. If you're not a video person, again, and you do shoot photos, you know that shooting in RAW is gonna give you the best dynamic range and the ability to edit your, 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 uh, your photos and color correct where you see fit. It's the same thing with an S-Log3 picture profile. So first up, personally, I think that every camera kit needs a wide angle lens. And I'm using the Sony Vario Tessar FE 24-70. I can't tell you how many years I've had this lens. It's kind of been my go-to for landscape photography. I do think that it's gonna be used for certain shots with wildlife. And I do have images in my mind of where I would use this. I'm talking about maybe some type of field where you're able to get close to your subject. Maybe it's a moose that's drinking in a river or stream right in front of you. And then you've got some really dramatic clouds in the background or a sunset and you want to capture that entire image, that entire environment and bring it into uh, a beautiful, concise photograph that's gonna encompass everything of what that moment was. Next up, we have the Sony 70-200 f4. And I think that a 70-200 might be my most used lens. With wildlife, you're able to kind of jump around from focal ranges, especially when you're shooting, uh, when you're walking around trees or you're walking around in the forest and you're just kind of on the, on the run and you, you happen to see a bird perch in front of you or there's a deer that's relatively close by and you can kind of capture the whole scene of them meandering their way through the tree line. And I think 70 to 200 has got to be something that I, I take for granted with my photography because I use it in just so many different applications. Now I'm going to skip over the 200 to 600 for the moment, which is this bad boy right here. And I'm gonna start talking about my photography blind. I'm using the Tragopan Grouse V Plus, and this is a hooped pop-up blind that erects in mere seconds. It has one main shooting window and comes with interchangeable window panes depending on the level of camouflage or secrecy that you're looking for. The blind itself weighs nine pounds. It has a packed dimension of 3.5 by 20 by 20 inches. So it's really, really compact. It fits into my backpack whenever I'm trekking out into the woods to set up the blind for a photography session. 
I personally have been completely satisfied with this uh, this photography blind. I think Tragopan makes some really high quality blinds. I know that you could go to Cabela's or other types of sporting goods stores or even Amazon and find cheaper pricing on blinds themselves, but I just don't think that you're gonna get the customizable options that Tragopan offers. So as I mentioned a couple moments ago, when I shoot video, I am shooting in the S-Log3 format, and that has a minimum, a minimum ISO of 800. So when I'm using my Sony 200 to 600, f5.6 to 6.3 in the middle of the daytime, if I wanna stay at that 6.3 aperture, I need to stop down the lens because with an 800 ISO, I can start blowing out shadows real bad and I'm not able to recover those when I'm using the S-Log3 picture profile. So I am using a B plus W or BW ND filter. Now it's got some super long name that I'm not gonna go ahead and read. Maybe I'll just throw it up on the screen here. Take a moment, read through it, it's long. The reason that this is such an important piece of kit is it allows me to shoot in the middle of the day but still use that, that lower aperture of 6.3. It might not be uh, the most relatable for all of you that don't necessarily shoot video but it's important for me and that's why it's absolutely a must have in my camera bag. Something new that I wanted to try this year was get more audio when I'm shooting video. I love to shoot the common loons in Maine. They're everywhere, essentially. If you can find a lake or a pond, you're gonna find a loon. And they have some of the most beautiful calls. And I would love to capture more of that. So I purchased the Rode VideoMic NTG. This mic also makes for a great voiceover when I'm creating YouTube videos, but for wildlife specific usage, it's gonna be able to allow me to capture bird calls and boost up the quality of video that I create. Again, it's not needed if you're not doing video or if you care about the, the audio of the video that you do get, but for me, it's very important. One of the newer purchases that I have going on is the Browning Spec Ops Elite HP5 trail camera. I've had this thing out in the woods for about a week, and let me tell you, I got a bunch of squirrels, I got more squirrels, and then I got more squirrels. It's like that one song, girls, 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 but it's squirrels, squirrels, squirrels. It's what I've gotten so far. I did get one raccoon poking its head up a tree, and I also got some blue jays that had to, have, must have been feeding on the bird sea that had fallen down to the ground. Uh, but this trail cam is gonna be ultra utilized this season. I know it's not something that goes directly into my bag, but it's what's in my bag. Give me some latitude here of what I can put into my bag. It has a bunch of cool features. It's got a two inch screen that makes checking the, the trail cam itself really easy when I go out and see if I've gotten anything. All right, I've waited to the last must have to talk about my big 200 to 600 f5.6 to 6.3 Sony lens. And let me tell you, I love this lens. The comparable lenses are the Sigma 150 to 600 f5 to 6.3. And the price of that lens is $1,900. So personally for me, I, I'm, I'm not so much of a Sony freak. I'm not a live, live and die by Sony and whatever they put out. But I love the fact that this 200 to 600 is an internal zoom. The Sigma model is an external zoom. So you have the lens hood basically popping in and out, popping in and out. And that's something that I know isn't really much of a factor, but it's more movement when you're out in the field trying to be secret. And it might introduce a little bit of set more sound. I haven't used the lens, so I don't know for sure, but for a multitude of reasons, I'm sticking with the 200 to 600. I really like the internal zoom factor. But there's one thing that I gotta tell you. A few months ago, I was out hiking in the Moosehead Lake region and I was carrying around my 200, 600 in my hand like it was you know, just some water bottle or something, but it wasn't. It was a $2,000 lens attached to a $2,500 camera body and, and I made the mistake of stepping on a tree root. And if you've ever been hiking in the woods, and you've stepped on a tree root that happens to be wet, you know it's as slick as ice. And I fell right onto my butt, and then holding my lens, I put my hand out to stop my fall, and I slammed the lens directly onto the same tree root that I slipped on. When I got up, I didn't think that there was any problem. I looked in my camera, it was still on. I looked 
I checked the aperture ring to make sure that everything was still internally working. Everything was working. I was great, no problem. Went home that evening and then tried to zoom in and out and I dented the zoom ring. Oh man, it, it, it is, made my photography somewhat complicated, but if you, if you have the option to zoom and zoom in and out, you wanna have it. So I found that lately I've just been sticking either at 600 millimeters or I've just been going back down to 200 millimeters depending on the type of shoot that I'm going for. This mistake and this damage is gonna be something that I'm gonna have to figure out pretty soon. I'm gonna try to get myself through the spring and into the summer using this lens, but for that reason, it is the first item that's going to be on my wish list. The 200 to 600, that's out of the way. It's on the wish list. It's gonna be something that I'm gonna try to get sooner than later, but let's talk about something that's not so depressing, and that's going to be a drone. A drone. I've needed a drone for so long and I think in the next month I'm finally gonna pull the trigger and get a drone. Now I'm looking at the DJI Mini 4 Pro and it just seems to be the one that all of those like professional consumer, pro prosumer photographers use and videographers use. It's gonna have the 4K 60, I think it does 4K 100 as well so you can get some slow motion shots. I don't know how well the low light works, but I've seen some great sample footage on YouTube and that's the one that I'm gonna start with. It's not overly expensive. I think you can get a package with some batteries in the, the controller mechanism for around $1,200. And that's about the extent that I think I'd be willing to pay for for the time being. All right, so finally, we have reached the point that you might have been waiting for this entire video. If you're still with me, thank you so much. I'm glad that you're enjoying it. And that are the items that I'm going to keep at home. Now I'm gonna explain all of these items and talk about kind of the gear specs behind all of these. And then I'm gonna explain why I'm leaving one of these setups at home more often than not, not always, but more often than not in 2024. First up, we got the Robus RC5570 Vantage Series 3 Carbon Fiber Tripod. This thing I've been using for quite some time. I've lugged it around. It is a somewhat heavy tripod coming in at 5.6 pounds, but it's very sturdy. Let me tell you, this thing locks into place. It's got these rubber knobs at the bottom. They don't move around. It's got three different adjustable rings that you can get the height that you need. It's got a max height of 70.1 inches. That thing, that's tall, man. I've never needed to use that. The minimum height is 25.4 inches. And I found that when I'm in my photography blind and I've got my tripod with me, I, all I have to do is just make some micro adjustments to get that to the right height that I need. Now moving on from the tripod, we're gonna talk about the monopod that I most recently purchased. And that is the Robus RCM 439 four section carbon fiber monopod. What I like about this thing, it is super light and it's not that expensive. I think I got this one with a coupon for like 25% off for around a hundred bucks. It has a load capacity of 39 pounds. So again, well over the weight that I would ever need. It's got a max height of 65 inches. It has a minimum height of 21.1 inches. And this is perfect. This is a perfect size to be kind of crouched down. If you see something and you're walking around, you got your monopod over your shoulder and you need to get real low to the ground, maybe you get a shot that captures some of the grasses coming up and you've got a deer in the field and you wanna give some of that blurred out grass ambiance into an image, this thing's gonna allow you to do that and you're still gonna be stable. You don't have to handhold too much, especially if you're capturing video. So the monopod's been a great addition and with the monopod purchase, I also got the Leofoto MPG-01 side saddle tilt head and I'm happy with the quality. It's like this aluminum milled machined gear that just feels and looks clean and it's getting banged up a little bit, but I have had no issues. These knobs, especially with this tilt head, locks in place real well, real tight. Uh, some of the specs on the ball head that I use, this is the Leofoto LH55 low profile ball head, and it has a load capacity of 55 pounds. Now, when I'm out shooting landscape photography, I use this ball head all the time, but 
I do on occasion bring my 200 to 600 with me. So if I do see some form of wildlife, I can throw on the 200 to 600 onto this ball head and still have a really secure ball head that's not gonna fumble around on me. Again, gets nice and tight, so if, if I wanna keep a, a static shot, or if I wanna loosen it up and do micro adjustments, I have the, uh, the tension custom ability to, to make those changes, and it still functions in itself. So I threw it onto this list. I don't always bring it out into the field when I'm doing wildlife, but I put it on the list of keep it at homes because this tilt head is really, really, really great, especially paired with my monopod. And then lastly, I've got the Surui PH10 carbon fiber gimbal head. Now, if I'm gonna be bringing a tripod out into the field, I will always, pretty much always have the gimbal head attached to it. This gimbal head has a load capacity of 33 pounds and it has a weight of only 2.2 pounds. Now I wanna talk about why all of this gear is at the keep at home section of the video. And that's because in the last couple weeks that I've been shooting, I have paired my monopod with my tilt head and I've been able to go out and capture both photography but also video with this setup. Let's talk about some quick totals here. The Sony a7 IV paired with the 200 to 600 plus the tripod plus the gimbal head comes out to a total weight of 13.85 pounds. Remember that, 13.85 pounds. With the Sony a7 IV, the 200 to 600, the monopod and that tilt head that comes out to 7.87 pounds. That difference is nearly six pounds. And when you think about all of the gear that you're bringing out into the field, you've got your, you got your lens, you got multiple lenses, you got your camera body, you got your, potentially you're bringing out your, your photography blind, you've got your water, you've got your food for the day, you've got the weight of the backpack, all of your accessories. We're starting to get pretty heavy here. So if I can cut out six pounds for my kit, I'm gonna do it. As a hybrid photographer jumping between photo and video, if I have the ability to still get stabilized footage with a monopod, that's far better than something that I could handhold and I'm cutting out six pounds from my camera bag by not bringing the tripod, leaving the tripod and the gimbal at, at home and replacing it with this monopod and tilt head has actually changed my approach to wildlife photography. And, and that's why in 2024, I'm gonna leave the tripod and the gimbal head at home. If I'm gonna go out and I know that I'm gonna sit in one spot with my photography blind or photography blinds left at home, and I'm gonna be stationary, I'm gonna bring the tripod and I'm gonna bring the gimbal and I'm gonna be completely happy. It has its places. I'm not saying that I'm gonna always leave it at home, but for this year, I'm gonna be using a monopod a hell of a lot more. You tell me what you think. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. Am I wrong here? Is it ridiculous to leave a tripod at home when I do shoot video and I do shoot photo and I might not get the perfectly stabilized footage if you're a videographer out there, let me know if I'm wrong. If you think that I might be right and then I'm on to something or that you have done the same thing, please let me know as well. With that, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I post videos every week and I can't wait to show you what I got going on next week. But for now, thank you again for watching and I look forward to seeing you again soon.